David. If you need this, you can turn this on. We got some seats down front if anybody needs one. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Excellent. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Doug Bradburn. I'm the founding director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington right across the street from here. And this wonderful Michelle Smith Lecture Series is a library program, but we're delighted because of the enthusiasm to welcome you down to this larger auditorium right here in the bosom of the historic footprint, George Washington's Mount Vernon. Uh, it's really fantastic to welcome you all tonight. A special thank you goes out to the Smith family. Uh, and the Robert H. Smith Family Foundation, which supported this in honor of Michelle Smith, uh, the daughter of Robert H. Smith. And tonight, uh, I'd like to specifically mention Clarice Smith, who is in the room. Uh, thank you so much for your continuing support and your patronage of so many important things. Uh, it's really fantastic to have the ongoing support of the Smith family. Let's give a round of applause. It was my great honor, actually, uh, to meet Robert H. Smith back in 2002 or three, no, four, I guess, when the uh, Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies was, uh, uh, was given its name. Uh, I was a fellow there at Monticello. And that's, uh, I know, God forbid, right? But uh, it's, uh, it's one of the reasons I actually came to Mount Vernon, because as, as an academic, I kind of knew what those sorts of centers could do for the field and, and bringing really the academic world and the public together in fruitful conversations about history and its importance. Uh, and so I always have a very soft spot uh, for the Robert H. Smith uh, International Center and the Smith Foundation, uh, and it's really a delight to, uh, to thank them tonight. All right, so I have to do one announcement of protocol, Steve McLeod tells me, I must say, uh, which is that for those of you who would like to go to dinner after this event in the inn, they'd like you to get in there by 8.15 so they get the kitchen all ready and, and get you a nice full meal if you need to, to get that done. So try to get in there by 8.15. Uh, you should have time to get your book signed and, and move in there quickly. Now let's get to the main event. David O. Stewart attended Yale. Uh, it's a school you may have heard of. It's a small school, uh, but a very important one, for undergrad and law degrees. As a trial and appellate lawyer for more than 25 years, he defended accused criminals. He challenged government actions as unconstitutional. He argued cases in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. And he was telling me just now that at that point, the, the law, he had had it with the law. The law had had it with him. And he, and he had decided he'd read enough bad books, he knew that he could do that. So uh, he went on to write great books. His first attempt, the summer of 1787, The Men Who Invented the Constitution, was a Washington Post bestseller, won the Washington Writing Award as best book of 2007. That's, that's a pretty good first try. Uh, two years later, he wrote Impeach, the trial of President Andrew Johnson and the fight for Lincoln's legacy, which was called, quote, by all means, the best account of this troubled ep episode by Professor David Donald at Harvard. Uh, the Society of Cincinnati awarded David in 2013 its history prize for his book, American Emperor, Aaron Burr's Challenge to Jefferson's America, an extraordinary uh, study of that uh, duplicitous man, Aaron Burr, that man, Aaron Burr. Uh, another award, extraordinary for this amateur author who just decided to do it on a whim. Uh, and then he said, well, let's, you know, that's enough nonfiction for me. So he wrote a historical mystery about the John Wilkes Booth conspiracy, The Lincoln Deception, with which Bloomberg View called the best historical novel of the year. Why not? There was David O. Stewart again. And Publishers Weekly said it was an impressive debut novel, of course. Um, and I'm, I'm led to understand that the next, the sequel to that uh, is coming out this fall. Uh, and it's on uh, the, what is called the Wilson? The Wilson Deception. The Wilson Deception. And so that's, uh, it sounds like a, a League of Nations uh, thriller. For, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, that wasn't a laugh line, David, so, wow. All right. So, but tonight, tonight we're going to read. We're going to hear about his uh, his new nonfiction book, Madison's Gift, uh, 
five partnerships that built America. The Washington Post called it a portrait, quote, rich in empathy and understanding by an acknowledged author and master of narrative history. Uh, I read a review by Gordon Wood earlier, who many of you know and, and, and heard, and he said, uh, there's nothing new to say about Madison, but somehow David Stewart has said it. So uh, we're going to find out all about that. Let's everybody give David Stewart a big welcome. Thank you very much, Doug. I really like League of Nations Thriller. That's that. that <laughs> when we may go with that in the in the publicity. Uh, I uh, became fascinated with James Madison, whom I had encountered in uh, earlier efforts, um, really for two reasons. Uh, and he is a guy who sort of warms. You have to warm up to a little, um, and that's. Uh, been, I think, sort of his curse as a historical figure. Um, but two, two factors really drew me to him and made me want to study him a great deal. Uh, the first was that he was so central to the founding. Um, and I became persuaded he's more central, really, than any figure other than James, Wa uh, excuse me, George Washington. Yeah. Washington is the immense figure. He is uh, without equal without peer in that era. Um, but I think after him comes Madison and for 30 years he was really at the center of the pivotal events in our history and just to run through them quickly. Uh, in the 1780s when the nation is at risk of falling apart under the Articles of Confederation there's active talk of having three separate countries, New England, Middle East States and the Southern States. Um, Madison helps lead the effort to call for a new government, which leads to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. At that convention, of course, he's central to the deliberations and the writing of the Constitution, often called the father of the Constitution. Uh, the Constitution was not, we sometimes forget, a slam dunk. It turned out that there was a lot of opposition to it. When it was first released to the public, there was no Bill of Rights. It created a much more centralized government than some people were expecting. And so the ratification fight was a tough one. And again, Madison was in the forefront, joining with Alexander Hamilton in writing the Federalist essays, still the finest political essays written by any Americans. When the, first, the new government is founded, he is the most significant member in the first Congress, often referred to as George Washington's prime minister. He wrote the Bill of Rights. How cool is that? <laughs> you know, and then he secured their adoption. He co-founded the first American political party with Thomas Jefferson. I think both of them would be spinning in their graves if they could hear me say that. They were not great fans of political parties, but then again, they started the first one. It was then called the Republican Party. It's changed over the years, but it is still with us as the Democratic Party. Then in the pivotal election of 1800, he was co-architect with Jefferson of the peaceful transfer of government from the Federalist control to the Republicans. It's often said that the true test of a democracy in a republic is the peaceful transfer of power between contending parties. You've probably been reading in recent weeks about an election in Nigeria where they're hoping that that's actually happened in that sometimes troubled country. In 1800, we passed that test, and it was Madison with his close partner, Jefferson, who made that happen. He was Secretary of State for eight years, supervised the Louisiana Purchase, which doubled the size of the nation. He was our first wartime president, leading the nation into the War of 1812. I was taught as a boy that the War Hawks in Congress led us into the War of 1812, but when I studied it, I just concluded that was quite wrong. It was President Madison who concluded we needed to go to war and who led the nation into war and through it. And when the war was finally concluded, the nation experienced a wonderful birth of prosperity, a burst of migration out west and immigration from Europe. When he leaves office in 1817, there's, there are encomiums to him. He is the 
American president who has had the most cities and counties named after him of all of them, including George Washington. <laughs> and it struck me on thinking about that that James Madison could well be our only two-term president who had a better second term than his first term. <laughs> if you think back to your own life, that second term can be tough. Now, that's all the amazing achievements he had. But the second fact that really led me to most want to write about him was that he's so little noticed. I found myself telling the editor that he's sort of the zealot of the founding. He's always there, but nobody's paying any attention to him. And I wanted to know why that was. I wanted to examine that issue. And there is a flip answer to the question. He was short. <laughs> he was skinny. Uh, he was losing his hair. He had a small voice. And in a room that was filled by George Washington, who was a person of great stature and great physical stature, great presence, or a tall, graceful, charming fellow like Thomas Jefferson, or even just noisy people like John Adams and Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> it was hard to notice James Madison. And I think that creates a historical memory that still lives with us. So although it's a flip answer, I don't think it's a wrong answer. But there's another more interesting answer, I concluded, that he was different from most great leaders. Most of them really need to be at the front of the parade, preferably on a white horse. They're people with strong streaks of narcissism. They crave recognition and acclaim and applause. Madison lacked those qualities. There's a wonderful moment when he is elected president and he's sworn in. This is March of 1809 and the first inaugural ball happens. We've never had one before. And an old friend greets Madison and says, isn't this a wonderful occasion? My greatest congratulations. And Madison says, well, I'd really rather be home in bed. <laughs> and it's true. He disliked public events. He never became comfortable at them. He was not particularly good at them. He did not shine in the spotlight. He was a man who cared about results, not applause about the work of his life, which was to make the American experiment in self-government a success, about realizing the promise of our revolution. I became fascinated by a memory of a long-term colleague of his who said, under all circumstances, he was ever mindful of what was due from him to others, and cautious not to wound the fields of feelings of anyone. And that phrase resonated with me, ever mindful of what was due from him to others. I think most great leaders are quite mindful of what is due to them from us, less so the other way around. And I found that when I examined Madison's remarkable contributions, he did not often work alone. He formed remarkably productive partnerships. And it was almost as though he had taken a modern personality test, the sort of test that organizations love to give their people these days. You know, you find out are you an introvert or an extrovert or an ISBJ or an XRZW or whatever. <laughs> and he concluded that he was in fact short. <laughs> he was skinny. He had a small voice and he was losing his hair. And he had zero personal magnetism. <laughs> Now, a candid self-assessment, though, would also acknowledge that he was smarter than just about anyone he met. He had a rare capacity for hard work, great political judgment and foresight, and a gift, a gift for making connections with people, for working with people. So why not make cause, common cause, with those who could complement his great strengths with theirs? Now, we don't know that he made such an assessment, but the idea provided for me a clarifying lens through which to examine his extraordinary career.
is a man who understood the power of partnership. And I think that's an idea that's important in every era, but maybe has particular power in our era when the gift of political partnership seems somewhat atrophied. Now, I use this lens to study five central partnerships. Some of them I acknowledge waxed and waned over the years. And he formed them with very different people. I'm going to walk somewhat quickly through the first four and then linger a bit on the fifth. Oh, I've already, I'm already off sequel, sequence. Um, this is an image of the signing of the De uh, Constitution, and it is an illustration of how Jefferson, uh, excuse me, Madison was hard to find. Madison, uh, Washington is easy to find there. Madison is next to him. The artist has given him a quill pen so we can find him. Um, <laughs> But it, it's a good symptom of the problem. Now, the first partnership is, was with Alexander Hamilton, and they were awfully different people. Uh, Hamilton was a flashy, charismatic character, effectively orphaned as a young teenager, came to this country with nothing. He made everything he achieved on his own talent, and his talents were astonishing. He was brilliant at everything he tried as a lawyer, as a soldier, as a financier, as a statesman. It was pretty much nothing he couldn't do. And he had a big personality. If he came into the room, he took over the room. If he'd had enough to drink, he'd jump up on the table and lead the room in song. Madison, so different. He was a fortunate son. He was the son, eldest son of the largest landowner in Orange County, Virginia, who owned thousands of acres, owned a hundred slaves. He did not uh, break out on his own as a young man. When he traveled on uh, public business, he would simply take a room in a boarding house. And he didn't have a home of his own until he was 43 when he married. Indeed, I like to point out that he lived with his mom until he was 78. <laughs> uh, she lived to 97. And it is also a pretty good barometer of what a tolerant person Dolly Madison was. <laughs> now, when Hamilton and Madison first meet, they certainly noticed the differences between them, but I think they noticed two key elements they shared. And this happens in the early Confederation Congress. This is still under the Articles of Confederation, a Congress that frankly couldn't do much and was not a terribly distinguished body. Madison and Jefferson are both in their early 30s. And they can see first that they are, by acres, the smartest people in the room. They can see the talent that each of them has. They clearly acknowledged it immediately and were drawn to each other for that reason. But also, they shared a fire, a commitment to making the United States the experiment in self-government, making it work, and making the United States a great nation. Their first great collaboration was in calling the Constitutional Convention. Hamilton, who was always quick to come to conclusions, decided the Articles of Confederation were unsatisfactory before they took effect. And Madison took a little longer to come to that decision. He wanted to see how they worked out in practice, but agreed after a couple of years. They led that effort, and that effort was successful largely because both of them prevailed upon their sponsor, George Washington, to agree to come, because nothing could succeed in this country without Washington's support in that era. They had very different experiences at the Philadelphia Convention. Hamilton had a terrible time. He was stuck in a New York delegation with two people he didn't agree with on anything. They went home, and he ended up with no delegation. He also committed the remarkable political blunder of saying what he thinks. <laughs> he told the delegates that he thought the president should serve for life, which sounded a lot like a king, and that he thought the Senate should serve for life which sounded a lot like dukes and earls. He really became the odd man out. And on the final day of the convention, when they're all about to sign it, he does come back to sign it. And he encourages everybody else to. 
saying no man's opinions of this document, no man's opinions differ from this document more than mine. But he signed the Constitution anyway. He thought it was the best chance we had to succeed. There's a wonderful entry in General Washington's diary that night. He was a wonderful diarist. He says the Constitution was signed today by 10 states and Colonel Hamilton. <laughs> he was not a shy man. Madison had a much more successful convention. He also didn't much like the Constitution. He thought that Congress should have a veto over state laws. He thought state le legislatures were the instruments of the devil doing terrible things. Uh, he disliked having a Senate that represented states rather than people. He thought it should have proportional representation. But he also thought it was the best we were going to get. So he committed to support it. When the fight for ratification began to shape up, Hamilton came up with the idea of leading a propaganda campaign with newspaper essays. And he blocked out a 25 essay program to explain the Constitution to the people. The best way to connect with people in America in those days was through the newspapers. We didn't have radio or TV or internet, anything like that. So newspaper writing was the real vehicle to reach people. Hamilton recruited in succession, three different New Yorkers to help him with writing these essays, and they all failed for different reasons. His fourth choice was James Madison, and what a fortunate one it was. They ended up writing 85 essays, not 25. They were 190,000 words in total. They wrote them in a six-month period. If you've ever written anything, 190,000 words in six months, even for two people, is astonishing. But what was astonishing, too, was the quality of the work. It really is the basic explanation of what our government is designed to be and what our image of ourselves as a nation was right at its birth. And when they put down their pens, they each went off to their state conventions. And they had coordinated the ratification fight in the other states, but then Hamilton goes to Poughkeepsie to the New York Convention, Madison to Richmond for the Virginia Convention, and they lead tough fights for ratification there in each, and they both win. Now, the second partnership is with George Washington. As I said initially, he had no peer. He was also 19 years older than Madison, old enough to be his father. And he was, as one great author described him, as the indispensable man. Madison understood this completely. He also understood that if he stood close to Washington, if he could make an alliance with Washington, he could have a great influence over what happened with the new nation. So he resolved to become the indispensable man for the indispensable man. If Washington wanted legislation through the state assembly in Virginia, Madison made it happen. If Washington wanted legislation through Congress, Madison made it happen. They developed a close political partnership for a period of five years. No one was closer to Washington than Madison. Madison would come and stay with him at Mount Vernon, right here, for days. Washington would cancel all of his work around the farm and simply put in his diary, met with Mr. Madison today. And when it came time to set up the new government, Washington turned to Madison to help him to write the new legislation that would set up each executive agency. When Washington comes to New York, it, it, it's worth a moment to think about what the government was. There were a few hundred soldiers we had in outposts on the frontier who were supposed to be watching the Indians. They were mostly drinking. <laughs> we had about 60 or 70 congressmen and senators. And we had maybe a dozen clerks and George Washington. That was the government. But Washington was committed to setting important precedents. He knew everything he did would set a precedent. So he wanted an, an inaugural address that would strike the right tone. 
It needed to be dignified and it needed to be significant. So he turned to James Madison to write it for him. Madison produced a very short tome, uh, but, uh, address, it only took 10 minutes to read. And it only asked for one thing, which was a Bill of Rights. So Congress received this inaugural address and started to think about, well, what president should they set? And they decided that they should prepare a response that would go to the president. And so they asked James Madison to write the response. <laughs> and Washington gets this response, which he wasn't expecting, and he isn't sure what to do, but he decides, you know, he's a Virginia gentleman, he'll write a reply. <laughs> so, you know, he asked Madison to write the reply. The uh, early days of the government were very much James Madison talking to himself. <laughs> now, the third partnership is the one I think we most think of with Madison, which is with Thomas Jefferson. And they were truly soulmates. They're, they were from the same world. They grew up 30 miles apart. Jefferson's eight years older, but they were both eldest sons of very rich men. They were both bookworms, both remarkably smart, interested in everything. They knew something about most things. Their correspondence with each other is a joy. Uh, they t t write about tools and agriculture and weather and climate and buried cities in Siberia and every now and then some politics. And they clearly so enjoyed each other's company. It is a treat to be able to eavesdrop on their friendship. They agreed on most political questions, although they did have a difference in style that was pretty fundamental. Jefferson was the great visionary. He thought in large sweeping strokes. We know his wonderful prose from the Declaration of Independence. His writing is always graceful. He sometimes could let his great ideas and wonderful prose get ahead of a good idea. And he got in trouble a few times in his career overstating things. His great friend Madison was much more analytical, much closer to the closer reasoned politician. As one current writer described, Madison was a fellow who when you debated him, you discovered that he knew your argument better than you knew your argument. <laughs> and it made a difference in how he wrote, because when Madison would write, you could almost, you could almost feel him in the middle of the sentence, he's writing something out, think, oh, but that's not always true, I need to qualify that. And he would write, include the qualification, and then he would think, well, I should qualify that too, because there's sometimes that's not exactly right. And you end up with sentences that can go on quite a while, and <laughs> a forest of subordinate clauses. Um, his writing has been likened by some to insurance contracts. Um, but Jefferson found as a practice that it was always a great idea to take his big ideas and run them by Madison. And Madison often would write back, that's a wonderful idea. But sometimes he would write back, that's a wonderful idea. But you know, you might think about A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. And Jefferson would drop it. <laughs> um, they both became disenchanted with the first Washington administration. Jefferson was Secretary of State, Madison as the leader in Congress. It was really Hamilton's financial program, which Washington backed and endorsed. It was the Bank of the United States and the assumption of state debts by the national government, which created a more powerful central government than Madison had anticipated would be possible under the Constitution. I think he was actually surprised. And they decided they needed to go into opposition. Madison began forming alliances within Congress with like-minded congressmen and became, instead of Washington's prime minister, he became the leader of the opposition. Jefferson ultimately leaves the government 
participate in this effort. They recruit like-minded politicians at state government levels and newspaper editors because what in a republic, the way you change people's minds, it turns out, is through political action. We have no king, we have no sovereign. What's sovereign is the popular opinion. So you, in order to influence popular opinion, they discovered for all they had denounced faction all of their political careers, all they had denounced political parties, they needed a political party. And they formed one. And as I mentioned earlier, they led it to success in 1800, indeed to domination. For a 24-year period, we had the remarkable sequence of three friends from Central Virginia who were president, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, all elected by this party. And that party was the dominant force in American political life up to the Civil War. Now, the fourth partnership was a fellow I didn't know too much about, James Monroe. He was not the same sort of intellectual as Jefferson and Madison. I was a little disappointed to discover that some of Monroe's contemporaries persisted in writing recollections about how he was a fine fellow but a bit dim, <laughs> which I think is unfair. He was, in fact, politically quite shrewd. And on occasion, uh, got things right that Madison got wrong. But he was not the sort of man who would be writing constitutions or declarations of independence. He was a military type. Again, another large strapping fellow. Uh, he had been a heroic soldier in the Revolution as a very young man. He was 18 when he went in the Army. And their friendship, which lasted 30 years, is striking because it involved two significant potholes. The first came in 1789 in the elections for the first Congress. Madison was very much identified as the leader of the pro-Constitution forces and the anti-Constitution forces, led by Patrick Henry in Virginia, wanted to keep him out of the government. So they blocked him from getting elected to the Senate, and then they tried to stop him from getting elected to the House of Representatives. And in order to stop him, they recruited the war hero, James Monroe, to run against him. And this is an era when candidates stood for office much more than they ran for office. Madison hated running for office. He always uh, recoiled in horror from it. But for this campaign, he ran. He and Monroe went to a number of public meetings. It was in January, and it was one of the coldest Januaries in Virginia uh, memory. And they stood out in the freezing cold and talked about the issues to the voters. Indeed, on the way home one night from one of those meetings, Madison had frostbite on his nose, which left a scar that he often referred to as a wound he had received in defense of his country. <laughs> but he did win that election, three to two. And a striking fact is that it appeared to make no difference in their friendship, that they had uh, confronted each other directly. And it's the only time in our history the two future presidents have run against each other for lower office. Now, 20 years later the story isn't quite so happy. Madison Secretary of State and Monroe is our ambassador to Britain and this is a time when the overwhelming fact in the Atlantic world is the war between Britain and France. It started with the French Revolution. It continued through the Napoleonic era. For 20 years, Britain and France tried to kill each other. They were only at peace for one year out of 20. And Americans became collateral damage, particularly our merchant ships. And so both sides would seize our ships when it suited their purpose. The British were particularly eager to seize our sailors, some of whom in fact were British deserters because it was 
easier service on an American merchant ship than on the Royal Navy. And for some dozen years, we absorbed these insults. And after Madison had been president for a couple of years, had tried, I'm sorry, I jumped over this. Monroe is our ambassador, and he is asked to come to a treaty with Britain, a trade treaty that will keep us from going to war with them. He produces a treaty. It's not a very good treaty. The British had no interest in being nice to us. They were afraid that Napoleon was going to defeat them. We were uninteresting to them. And Madison saw the treaty, which did nothing that he had told Monroe to get. So he and Jefferson simply put it in a bottom drawer and forgot about it. Monroe was mortified when he comes back to the country. He allows his name to be introduced in nomination for the presidency in 1808 against Madison. He opposes him for that office and for two years these longtime friends do not speak and they don't correspond. It really is a harsh time. But after these two years as president, his first two years, Madison decides that he needs to go to war. The country cannot absorb these insults any longer. He has an unfortunate Secretary of State, a man named Robert Smith from my home state of Maryland. Uh, sad to say. Smith was incompetent. Madison had to write his state papers for him. He also was disloyal. He would leak confidential cabinet communications. So Madison, who was very tolerant of bad cabinet members, was not able to put up with Smith. He was preparing to fire him, but he needed a replacement who would give his administration stature, who would strike the right note with European nations and with Americans. And there was nobody better suited for that than James Monroe, former soldier, former diplomat. And so they simply buried the hatchet. Monroe accepts appointment as Secretary of State after this two years of frosty silence. They pick up where they'd left off. Monroe becomes a great pillar of his administration through the war, serves as Secretary of State and Secretary of War, and for two separate periods, serves simultaneously as Secretary of State and as Secretary of War. I think he may be the only person in our history ever to do that. And together they do get us through the war. It is not a glorious war. I don't want to overstate that, but we succeeded in surviving it. And we signed a treaty that is restore us status quo before the war and against the world's greatest military and naval power, that was pretty good. Now the final partnership I'll spend a minute or two more on is with Dolly. In many ways she was the most interesting of the partners and she was the star. She brought the charisma, the warmth and the charm that it was hard for Madison to do. He might well not have been president and certainly would not have been as successful a president without her. Now, like James, she grew up on southern plantations. But there was a difference in their early lives. So you can see from this, which is the earliest image we have of her, she's wearing a Quaker bonnet. Her family was Quaker. And the Quaker meeting in Virginia decreed that members in good standing would not own slaves. So her father, who owned 10 or 15 slaves, freed them and moved the family to Philadelphia, where times were immediately very hard. His business failed. He died. But Dolly Payne, which was her maiden name, flourished. She was taller than most women of the era. She had Thick black hair, creamy complexion, bright blue eyes, an hourglass figure. Men liked her. Uh, men liked her a lot. Um, she, uh, I, I always like to point out that say what you will about Madison's small stature, he's skinny and he's balding. Um, 
of all the founders, he had the hottest wife. <laughs> um, Dolly had a first husband, uh, a Quaker lawyer. Uh, and they had two sons. The yellow fever epidemic in 1793 killed her husband and one of her sons, leaving her as a single mother. She did not want for suitors, though. She was immediately besieged. And perhaps the most ardent was James Madison, who was 17 years older than she. Something I do want to point out in this image, and in, I'll show you a couple more, too, with Dolly's images, you almost, you always see there's this hint of a smile. It's as though she's about to tell you a joke. And it, I think it is very expressive, not characteristic of the era. Uh, if I can show you a, James's portrait in the same time. <laughs> and, and this is the good one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is the one where he doesn't look like somebody just shot his dog, which is how many of his portraits look. He, ha he had a very sober look. This is the one where you can s he has a little zip. You can see him pursuing Dolly. Um, we don't know the event cr crisply, but there was some public event or s simply passing Dolly on the street which caused James to say basically, who is that woman? And he discovered who she was and that her mother had a boarding house where members of Congress stayed and that one of her boarders was his Princeton friend, Aaron Burr. So he prevailed upon Senator Burr to introduce him to this woman. And you can see Dolly's playful nature and her insight in a note she writes that afternoon to a friend when she says that Senator Burr is going to bring over for her to meet the great little Madison. <laughs> and it's perfect. He's little, but he's also great. He's a national political leader. He's rich. He's smart. He's kind. You could do a lot worse than James Madison. And I think Dolly figured that out very fast. Um, it was a treat to study their relationship and to see them and see Madison not as a political figure. They have a few letters to each other. They were rarely apart in 42 years of marriage. They are warm and loving letters after the first rush of infatuation. There are also wonderful accounts of James's flirtatiousness. The most frequent ones relate to Dolly's sister Lucy. Lucy was widowed with several children, and so she moved in with the Madisons in the White House with her children for several years. And by all accounts, she had lots of Dolly's charm and vivaciousness, and James enjoyed her company greatly. And one of the things he liked to do was to kiss Dolly in front of Lucy and then turn to her and say, does that make your mouth water? <laughs> I will admit it's a little creepy. <laughs> um, but you, you've never thought of James Madison that way. Um, now, the Madisons never had children of their own. There is the one son from Dolly's first marriage, and he is an unfortunate case as time goes on. And I think they're sometimes imagined as this semi-sad, childless couple, which was completely wrong. In fact, their house was usually overrun with children. They had dozens of nieces and nephews. I lost count after 50. And those nieces and nephews would come stay with them for weekends, for weeks, for months at a time, particularly young female relatives. Dolly would always see that they were paired up with appropriate army officers and naval officers. Friends' children would also come stay with them for long periods. If you could have your child go spend a few weeks or a couple of months in the White House, it'd be pretty tough to turn down. And in fact, it's often missed that the Madisons were a lot of fun. James was awkward in public 
events, big events. But in smaller events, he was terrific. He loved to tell jokes, tell long stories and anecdotes. He was known to keep a dinner table laughing. He was very fond of wine, by all accounts. Passed it around quite liberally. And Dolly was always gay and uh, exciting, larger, small settings. One of her nieces called her a faux de dullness. I think one of Dolly's keys was that she was so completely unpretentious. She liked to play cards, and she played cards badly. That's very charming. Um, she took snuff. Uh, you know, great ladies often don't take snuff. Um, indeed, one thing they, they apparently did in their retirement, this is Montpelier, of course, <clears throat> I hope You've mo all, as many of you have been there as possible, and the rest will go. They've done a great job restoring it. <clears throat> the portico out front uh, was the scene in their retirement of races between Mr. and Mrs. Madison. <laughs> now, you can look at that and say that's not a very long race, which is true. But they were retired. I mean, let's cut them a little slack. <laughs> um, indeed, there are accounts that during this period, Dolly, who had grown wider with the years, um, would load James up on her back and carry him around the house. <laughs> but it's important to remember that their fun had a purpose. Through James's eight years as Secretary of State and eight as President, Dolly bred a s set a bright social tone for the new government the new republic. And I love this image of Dolly during the Secretary of State years. And again, we have the small smile. She was gay, gracious. She always sought out the most awkward person in the room to put them at their ease. At one party, she was walking around with Cervantes' Don Quixote in her arm. And somebody said, why are you carrying that at a party? And she said, well, if the conversation flags, it's something to talk about. <laughs> she thought about these things. And she understood the need to provide glamour and charisma. James couldn't do it. So as wife of the president, she started wearing turbans, white turbans, sometimes velvet, sometimes satin. And she would put a, a flower in the top, sometimes a piece of fruit. <laughs> they had big receptions two or three times a week at the White House. And James would always greet everybody very diligently and boringly and then go off in the corner and talk with a couple of friends about business. And Dolly would stay in the middle of the room, charming everybody. And you could always find her. You know, she was, you look for the flower, you look for the fruit, and there she was. <laughs> and there was a famous exchange she had, sort of a public exchange with the Speaker of the House, Henry Clay, where he announces, Everybody loves Mrs. Madison, and she replied, that's because Mrs. Madison loves everyone. And it wasn't actually true. When you read the letters, you discovered that she actually held the grudge better than James did. <laughs> but it seemed to be true. And as we all know, in politics, that's much more important than what is true. They freely mixed foreigners and Federalists and Republicans and created a social swirl where ideas and opinions could be shared, where connections could be formed. It's a very important thing to have in government. Indeed, we discovered that office seekers would sometimes go to Dolly to seek an appointment. She was referred to in the era sometimes as the Lady Presidentess. The term First Lady had not come into use yet. We don't know, we have no record of her conversations with James about such matters, but we do know that some of those people got jobs. She was, in truth, a political partner, always a loyal and sure-footed one, who not only warmed his private life, but helped him forge a new style for the nation. The Federalist candidate for president in 1808 somewhat ungallantly claimed that he had lost the election to Mr. and Mrs. Madison. <laughs> and added, I might have had a better chance had I faced Mr. Madison alone. <laughs> now, Dolly's shining moment came on the worst day of James Madison's presidency, 
This is, of course, the burning of the White House by, uh, by the British soldiers who have just brushed aside the Maryland militia at the Battle of Bladensburg, a battle so brief it is sometimes referred to as the Bladensburg races. Um, Dolly is waiting for news. She gets the news that th she has to flee. She has packed up the state papers and the silverware, very practical, and she realizes that the Gilbert Stewart portrait of Washington is still on the wall. Now this was an iconic image even then. Washington's only 15 years dead, but he is still that quickly the embodiment of the nation. That portrait, copies of it, hang in many American homes. We don't have crown jewels, we don't have a scepter or a crown, but we do have the portrait of George Washington. And she directs that it be cut down. They can't get it off the wall, so they have to cut it out of the frame. And they whisk it away and save it from the British. Americans who despair at the humiliation of having their capital burned, indeed it is a great black mark on his presidency, I think it keeps him off the best five best presidents list that one bad day. But Americans who despaired of that loved Dolly's spirit and her presence of mind in saving the Gilbert Stewart portrait. Now the Madisons enjoyed a mostly happy retirement at Montpelier, but there was a dark shadow in it, which was a shadow that had been there for all of Madison's life. And that's slavery. I was struck that one story is so rarely addressed by people writing about Madison, which is that his grandfather was poisoned by his own slave and killed. This is a story that Madison never talked about. We have no record of him ever mentioning it. And I suspect that it wasn't talked about openly at Montpelier, but I also sus suspect that the 90 slaves and the eight or 10 Madisons who lived there all knew the story extremely well. And it's a story that captures the oppression, the violence that is inherent in slavery, which Madison understood completely. As a young man, he was, he agonized over slavery. He was committing his life to liberty, to self-government, and yet he owned people. He bought land in upstate New York and wrote a friend that he hoped to move up there and never live on the labor of slaves. Now, he never did it. Montpelier was comfortable. He had all these wonderful resources. Virginia was a great platform for his political career. When he gets to the Constitutional Convention, he's still a young man, he's only 37, it's striking that he tells the delegates there repeatedly, possibly uh, close to a dozen times, why are you arguing about large states versus small states and all of these other things you're arguing about? The only thing that can tear this nation apart is slavery, is North versus South. He has this in the core of his body. He knows that slavery is the, the sin that can ruin us. It seemed to me that through his remarkable political career, the important jobs he had, he was able to compartmentalize his feelings about slavery and somehow just get past them. It's something humans have a gift to do often. But when he retires to Montpelier and around him are the 90 slaves and he never leaves and neither do they. And Northerners and Europeans come visit him. It was a big thing. Many of you will know about Edmond Vernon, too. You just dropped in on the former president. It was an amazing time. And a lot of the people who dropped in liked to lecture him about slavery. And the times were changing. The Missouri Compromise in 1820 dealt with the expansion of slavery to Western territories. It was very controversial. Abolitionism is growing. You get the Nat Turner Rebellion in, late, in 1831 where slaves rise up, they slaughter 60 white people, we slaughter, in return, the white people slaughter 100 slaves in return. Everybody is terrified in Virginia. Dolly writes a friend, I know we cannot defend ourselves and so I am quiet. 
And Madison can't get away from slavery, so he does what he's always done. He starts writing memoranda to himself on the subject, and he writes long letters, and he tries to figure out the problem. He figured out how to get a new government in the 1780s when we were at risk of falling apart. He f took the nation into war to make it respectable in the international sphere with the War of 1812, and now there is this third great challenge. And even though he's old, he wants to take it on. And he comes up with these plans that involve selling off all our public lands, using the money to buy the slaves out of bondage, and then we ship them somewhere else. He couldn't imagine an integrated society. Just too much race prejudice. He didn't think it could be done. And it was all a pipe dream. We had almost two million slaves by then. There weren't enough ships. There wasn't enough money. There weren't enough places to take them. And it's a very sad thing. Indeed, he is so frustrated, he embarks on this one quixotic effort. It was common in those days, of course, to put the slave quarters someplace where they wouldn't be seen. They generally were not very nice. So he decided to build a model village for his house slaves. They're restoring this at Montpelier. And he put in glass windows for them, hung doors, plank floors. They were as nice as many non-slaves had in this country at that time. But there's something poignant and pathetic about this. This is what he does, but he never frees a single slave in his life. Now in his final years, James becomes more decrepit. His mind always remained bright until the last couple of months. He lived to be 85. He'd had many health issues through his life and expected to die young. He was surprised, as were many others, that he lived so long. Uh, we have this great image of him just two years before he died. Visitors would come and say hello and try to get away quickly because they didn't want to wear him out. He looked so terrible. And he would insist that they sit down and talk to him. And he would talk to them for hours. And he would say, well, nothing works anymore but my lungs. And uh, his mind continued sharp. Dolly took good care of him through those years. When he dies in 1836, she gets the care of Montpelier, which is more than she can manage. She is, has many wonderful qualities, but she is not a woman of business. She ultimately loses Montpelier and ends up in Washington City as part of the social world again. The thing I'm most grateful for is she lived long enough for us to get a photograph of her. This is taken during the first year of the Zachary Taylor administration. And I think you can get a feel for her strength of character. And also, the little smile is still there. Now, I've talked about Madison's partnerships, and I'd like to close with a note about Madison himself. Because I think he was able to form these partnerships because of who he was. We often think of him as this disembodied intellect. Well, one contemporary said, I've never seen so much mind in so little matter. <laughs> but his greatest qualities were his genuineness, his integrity, his modesty, and his open-heartedness. That's what all of these disparate characters appreciated about him. And I find these qualities shine through in an episode when he received the news of the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the War of 1812. It's February 1815. He's living in the Octagon House, because of course the White House has been burned. The Octagon House still stands on 17th Street. And a Pennsylvania senator hears the rumor that there is a treaty. Of course, it takes a long time for news to arrive from Europe. And he rushes to the Octagon House to ask the president what's going on. If you'll indulge me in reading a couple of sentences from the book. The senator found the house dark, the president sitting solitary in the parlor, in perfect tranquility, not even a servant in waiting. The senator asked if the rumor was true. Madison bade him sit down. 
I will tell you all I know, he said, and then confirmed that he thought there was peace, but he had no official confirmation. The senator recalled with some wonder what he called the president's self-command on the occasion and greatness of mind. The War of 1812 had truly been Mr. Madison's war, as his opponents called it. It was about principles, not gain. It was fought with a quiet tenacity, sometimes ineptly, and with endless tolerance of those who opposed it. A friend of Madison's wrote years later that the war had been conducted in perfect keeping with the character of the president. And when peace came, Madison welcomed it in a darkened house, sitting alone with his thoughts. Thank you very much. Hey, I talked too long and you have to get to dinner, so I will take two questions. Sir? With all your research that you've done, is there anything, oh, sorry. With all the research that you've done, is there anything during your research you've said to yourself, why the heck did he do that that way? Uh, yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, I mean, an episode that, that bothers me takes a little setting up, but I'll try to do it quickly. Uh, in the late 1790s, he's in opposition to the Adams administration. The Alien and Sedition Acts are ad adopted because we have a fear of war with France. The Sedition Act really restricts free speech. He and Jefferson mobilized to oppose this, and they draft the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, which are full-throated appeals to states' rights. Now, Jefferson writes the Kentucky Resolution, which goes way over the top. He didn't screen it by Madison. He should have. <laughs> but Madison writes the Virginia Resolution, and he goes a little bit over the top. And he even got to a point where the following year, when he is a member of the Virginia Assembly, he has to, he writes a long report for the State Assembly, and he starts walking back from the position he took there. So that was a moment when his dispassion, his judgment, I think, was clouded, and I was disappointed, because that, uh, their work became the basis for the doctrine of nullification which was used uh, by South and North, frankly, going into the Civil War, and then again during our civil rights era in the Southern Massive Resistance. I think it's been an unfortunate doctrine, and I wish he'd thought more times about it. One more. He, uh, you said he had it, was instrumental in the... You said he was instrumental in the Louisiana Purchase. Did he share Jefferson's views about the movement west for the country? Very much. Uh, he had been very engaged with, uh, one of the things he did with General Washington was uh, the, the canal, which of course never quite got finished, um, that Washington was so uh, dedicated to in order to open the Potomac as a highway to the west. And that was the first real partnership between Washington and Madison was getting the legislation and getting that project going forward. So Madison was completely committed to this notion of uh, westward migration and westward uh, development uh, and, uh, and did share that with Jefferson. It's interesting when the Louisiana Purchase information camp comes back, when the agreement comes back from Europe, uh, they have this problem, which is the Constitution doesn't let them do this. Um, <laughs> And Jefferson really worries about the problem. And it's interesting because it's sort of a change of position. Um, Jefferson really gets sort of wrapped around the axle on it. And Madison basically says, what are you talking about? That's a lot of land. And he says, don't worry about it. <laughs> so, and, and the key point, I think, was that there was nobody who was going to argue against it. Uh, so they both embraced it. So thank you very much.